this noise. <laughs> and we're going to go live. Can I talk? You can talk. <laughs> <laughs> well, hello. Welcome, everybody. Uh, it's Thirsty Thursday, so thank you for joining us on the Venissimo YouTube channel. My name is Robbie G, aka the Professor of Cheese, and I am here today with special guest Jay Boyd, who is the sales manager at Old Harbor. And um, you guys all, be before we get started, you guys all should have a cheese plate. We're going to walk you through everything. You all have a kit to make a couple cocktails, and some of you even got this beautiful bottle of Old Harbor Gin. Before we get into anything, um, I'm going to have Jade introduce herself and, and tell us a little bit about Old Harbor. Thank you. Of course. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Jade. I am uh, here with Old Harbor Distilling. Uh, really excited to be here, so thank you. Of course. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about our brand and then we'll jump into all the fun things that you have in your cocktail kit. Um, so Old Harbor Distilling, we are the oldest um, urban distillery here in San Diego. Uh, we're located in East Village on a K and 17th. Um, we opened our doors and released our first spirit, which is the San Miguel Gin on September 28th, 2014. That date is super important uh, for us and for the history of San Diego. Um, one of the things that was important to um, Michael Skubik, the owner of uh, Old Harbor, was to create a brand that really tied into the history um, and paid homage to the beautiful ingredients and history that we have here in San Diego. So, um, San Miguel came about because when Juan Cabrillo came here in 1542, he christened the port San Miguel. Uh, so that was the original name of the port, and so that's what we named our flagship spirit, San Miguel. Um, this gin is really bright, herbaceous, and really fun to work with. Um, a lot of fresh botanicals, cilantro, cucumber, lime, sage, and coriander. Uh, it's the perfect gin. If you don't know how to make um, really elaborate cocktails, all you have to do is pour this over ice, a little soda, a little, a little um, tonic, and you've got a beautiful cocktail. But today, we've created a couple of cocktails uh, super easy that you'll be able to make at home um, and then replicate in the future. So, with uh, yeah, so without further ado, let's get into the, the cheeses. We're going to tell you about the order um, and then um, uh, we'll talk more about the, the gin. And I love the history, I did not know that. So, I was like, I was kind of in a trance right there when you were talking. So, um, thank you for that. Um, so, you guys have on your cheese plate four cheeses. We are going to taste them in order. Um, so Jade is going to make a couple cocktails, maybe a little something special bonus too. We'll see, uh, not, not to ruin any surprises, but um, you, um, so what you have in front of you uh, are going to be tasted in this order. There is the um, the goat cheese. This is called Boost de Chev, and it is that round one, which is kind of softer with the with the bloomy rind. That's our goat cheese, Boost de Chev. The second one is this triangular deal. That's also a goat cheese, but that's age. That's the naked goat. Um, if, I don't know if we have to censor that. Sorry, should we censor the <laughs> naked goat? Um, the third cheese is the the Emmental Gourmino. And it, it's this guy right here, they're in these little rectangular chunks. And then this one is the Pasqui Sir. That's going to be number four on the plate. There's blueberries, cornichons, pickles. This, um, had to taste this one to, to figure out what it is. It's an apricot chili jam and it's delicious. And so play around with all the accoutrements. Or the, the accoutrements are just meant to cleanse your palate um, and to just play around with, with, uh, with the pairing um, with the cocktails as well. So um, the, as I said, the cocktails are not really formally paired. So feel free to, to mix and match everything with, with each of the cocktails that we're gonna make um, tonight. And um, we, can't talk, we can't just like start going into, go into the cocktails without you guys eating what's on your plate. So we're gonna um, say, Feel free to jump into the first cheese, which is the, the Boost de Chev. And I'll tell you a little bit about it, as I always do. This is it. We have show and tell because we're actually in our Mission Hills shop tonight. Um, this is the Boost de Chev. It comes from a place called Potu, which is um, pretty much the Loire Valley of France. The word Bouche means log, and so it's named for the shape. Um, of the cheese. It is a really traditional goat's milk cheese. It comes from really the, the epicenter of, of goat milk cheeses. 
in the world, which is the Loire Valley in France. This is a, a pretty young cheese. This is, um, I mean, this can come out as young as seven days, but this is probably more to like two to four weeks. Um, it ripens from the outside in. You can absolutely eat the rind on this one, and I highly recommend it. Um, but it's very traditional for a goat's milk cheese. It's going to be tangy and kind of sour, and um, hopefully it's going to stand up to the cocktail we're going to have in a minute. So, uh, I think so. Let's get into it. Okay, I'm gonna put this off to the side even though I really wanna dig in, but I'll come back to that. <laughs> so uh, you all have a cocktail kit in front of you. I'm gonna go over everything that's in that box and then we'll get started on the cocktail. Um, so Collins and Coop, great friends of ours. It is a bartending supply um, shop in North Park on El Cajon Boulevard. They provided um, basically every utensil or tool that you see here um, and some of the fun syrups that we have. So in your box, you should have a little two ounce or 60 milliliter um, bottle of blueberry lavender syrup. And that's what this is. Um, our friends at Collins and Coop um, gave us this. This is Sally's Greatest Simple Syrup Blueberry Lavender. So you've got some of that. Um, you should have received some limes. Um, if you haven't squeezed those already, go ahead and do that. I went ahead and squeezed my lime juice. And a little tip when you're squeezing fresh juice and using it in cocktails, you want to fine strain all the pulp out. One, you don't want pulp in your teeth. And two, if you're storing some in the fridge, it helps it stay fresh longer. So maximum like three days. Um, on your cocktail recipe, there's also a recipe for simple syrup, which I have here. So a simple syrup is a, a really easy, basic sweetener for cocktails. It's equal parts um, sugar and water. Um, mint. I've got my fresh mint here. Um, so I didn't pick all the leaves off of the stem because we're gonna use the stems. A lot of people don't know, most of the oils actually come from the stem. And then I reserved some of the tops here for garnish. What else? Bottle of gin, right? The star of the show is San Miguel Southwestern style gin. So, would you like me to start with the first cocktail? Yeah, let's do it. All right. So we're going to start with the Southside cocktail. Uh, this cocktail is really fresh and bright, has a lot of mint, which is gonna pair well with all of the fresh botanicals that are already in this gin. So I've got my cocktail tins here. Love this color, right? Nice matte black, Collins and Coop. Got my jigger. And I'm gonna start with lime juice. So I'm gonna do, I'm actually doubling my order, but I'm gonna tell you the recipe as we go. So you're gonna use three quarter ounce lime juice. And when you're using a jigger, you wanna hold it nice and flush. Um, it's just like baking, all of these measurements are exact. So I started with my lime juice. Um, next, I'm gonna use my simple syrup. And I'm gonna do three quarter ounce of that. And then I'm gonna use some mint. So really for mint in a cocktail, you just need about 10 leaves. Um, and I'm just gonna put this small little bunch here. You can break it up, throw it in the tin, take your muddler, and just give it like one or two turns. You're just releasing the oils in there. Um, if you over muddle your mint, it becomes really grainy and grassy and no one wants that in their cocktail. If you've got really good ice, uh, like a cold draft or a hoshizaki, you don't even need to muddle wrong bottle um, because the ice is firm enough to break that up for you so I just gave that a couple of turns and I'm gonna add my gin did I hear that right there's types of ice absolutely amazing um, so when you go Wait, to <laughs> with is this an Eskimo thing <laughs> like because it's like to me ties into the Eskimo joke it's but. a drinker thing <laughs> okay the drinker thing. it is you know we take so much time creating these beautiful cocktail recipes <laughs> yeah. And the ice is a part of the recipe. So we've got cool <laughs> machines these days that actually create um, super dense ice that melts a lot slower. So your cocktail retains its integrity um, the longer you sip on it. Uh, versus like the ice that you get that you put in your cooler in the summer, that stuff melts really quickly. Um, so we don't want to use that, but if that's what you have, it's totally fine. Um, so I went ahead and added um, my gin. And we'll share the essence the recipe for ice later on. Yes. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna add my ice. Okay. 
Question Jade. Yes. Did you ever put the ice in and then the liquor over? Or do you always do the liquor first and then the ice? So, you know, when you're making cocktails at home, you can do whatever suits your fancy, right? But when we're talking about ice being an ingredient, it's important to add ice at the very end because it is melting as we go, right? And I don't want my cocktail to be over diluted. Um, I want it to be perfectly chilled and perfectly diluted. So I'm gonna shake and I'm gonna shake sitting down. So this is like a fun, like leisurely <laughs> way to bartend. I'm digging it. Nice. Good way to get exercise in the quarantine too. <laughs> Should I type my abs while I'm doing this? <laughs> I forgot to mention, if anyone has questions or if you want to comment, you just have to sign in. And uh, Gina, who's behind the scenes, is taking questions and comments. Okay, so I can feel on the outside of this tin that it's frothy, frosty, really cold. Yeah. It means it's done. Set this back here. So because all of that mint broke up into tiny little pieces, I'm gonna use this fine strainer and I'm gonna strain my cocktail into this coupe glass. You don't have to do this, but it just catches all of those little pieces of mint. So I made two cocktails, right? Because I wanted to show you an easy way to make two cocktails out of this recipe. So this is a Southside cocktail. If I add some sparkling water, it becomes a Southside Ricky. So today I brought some lime, excuse me, Perrier. And I'm gonna add that to the glass. And why am I putting it at the bottom instead of on top? Because I want this to perfectly mix when I pour my cocktail. You don't want all of that soda to be sitting on top of your cocktail. I mean, that's a perfect pour if I ever saw one. Okay. She's a professional. Give yourself a little pat on the back. Well, thank you. Well, so for this one, you're okay with a little mint pieces? I'm totally okay with it. Yeah. It looks pretty in the glass. Yeah, it does. So we're gonna do, do two different garnishes. Um, I'm gonna use this lime, and I'm gonna make a nice zest or twist. And I'm gonna express this right over this cocktail. So expressing this releases all of the oils. And if we were like really up close, you might be able to see, I'm just gonna pinch this in half, and all of these oils are gonna release on top of this. You can also take this. Oh, yeah. And if you want to get real fancy, you can do it down on the stem. So then when you touch your glass, your hands are going to smell like lime. Oh. I twist that up, set it right inside. Gorgeous. Gorgeous. I'll set that there. So now, this cocktail, I reserved some of the mint. And this mint wasn't the best. Um, it weren't, they weren't really big, beautiful leaves. But you know what? It's going to taste the same. We're working with it. So I'm taking a nice little bouquet and I'm pinching it and I want to release these oils as well. So I can slap it on my hand, but I like to slap it on the glass. As I spin it, that's releasing more of that mint oil right onto your glass. And then I'm going to just put this right in the corner. And then I'm going to take this straw and I'm going to put the straw right by the mint. Why? Because then when we go to drink, I'm drinking and smelling all of those beautiful fragrances. So, two cocktails in one recipe. Beautiful. Cheers. Woo. Cheers. I gotta give you a round of applause yeah. for that. Thank I mean, you. you have done this before, I think. Maybe once or twice. <laughs> <laughs> um, but not well, sitting down. Well, that was impressive, I must say. I'm enjoying it. The, um, grab your cheese plate. I'm I want going you to try to, yes. a couple cheeses. Okay. So I talked about the first cheese, and I think what we should do is maybe try a little bit of all four of them with okay. each cocktail, and then I love we'll it. go back and try them all again, and then we'll we'll hear people's comments and what they think, and perfect. We'll see if anyone spilled, you know, their their cocktail all over the place when they were hitting the, the mint on the glass <laughs> or what happened. Um, My <laughs> so, hands smell great. Do your hands I smell know. good? I know. I mean, this whole thing is just. I mean, the the aroma is just coming up. I love it. Um, okay, so I told you about the the bouche de chev, which. I have a big piece in front of me, so I assume you guys all have a pretty big piece, so that was good to get started on that one. The second one um, is also a goat cheese, and mm. I called it the naked goat. Why is it the naked goat? Well, this is um, this is actually, uh, well, it's, a, it's an aged goat cheese, but usually this cheese gets aged in a, in a red wine. It's from Spain, it's from a, a region called Murcia, 
And um, the, the other version we have, which is called Drunken Goat, is the same cheese, but they will soak the cheese in red wine for two or three days, and then they'll let it age for a few months. And the rind is this kind of burgundy, purplish, reddish, and it, ta I mean, it tastes like the wine, obviously. Mm -hmm. This one is just a natural rind. It's edible, it's a little crusty and funky. This is aged a little bit longer than the Drunken Goat. If anyone is familiar with the Drunken Goat, it's a little bit more um, soft and supple in texture. Um, so um, I, I, when I am tasting or, or pairing, what I recommend doing is trying the beverage on its own. Okay. Some people say try the cheese first, but I say try the beverage first because the cheese is mouth coating. Next step, try the cheese. Third step, buy the cheese, wash it down with a cocktail, and see how they all play together. Okay. Now I say that, but for you people at home, do whatever you want. Do what you want. <laughs> but that's just how we <laughs> taste like a pro, if you will. Okay. Right. Well, I'm going to start with the Southside Ricky. Okay. Light, refreshing. I get that mint, but I still get a lot of the cilantro. So now I'm gonna I'm gonna taste some cheese. So um, and I should say the um, there there's a lot of obviously citrus going on, mm. and um, the 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 cheeses that are typically most or most often paired with any kind of citrus are goat's milk cheeses, and not just goat's milk cheeses, but very young goat's milk cheeses. Like so, the traditional goat cheeses that we probably all think of are the softies. Mm -hmm. We may not think of this as being a goat cheese, but it is made with I would never would have thought that. Yep. So, I mean, most of them are softer cheeses, and those tend to do really, really well. Not to put any thoughts in your head, but they do really well with citrus, so mm -hmm. we'll see. I love the creaminess of this. Um, I think it goes really well with their herbs. Mm -hmm. So I pick up a little bit of citrus. I have a question about, like, this isn't as tangy mm -hmm. as I, in my mind, like a goat cheese is, like yeah. if I'm eating a chef or something. Yeah. Why is that or what causes that extra tang? Gosh, um, so the goat's milk is less fatty. Um, and so because it's less fatty it, and it, it tends to be not aged for very long. And so when it's made and served younger, it has like a less complex flavor. It's very, um, it's it just takes on a sour note as opposed to like, Sheep's milk and cow's milk, they're way, they're way fattier and fattier. You experience it more as like a rich kind of more depth of flavor. So it's just, it's, it has to do with the fat okay. levels in the cheese. So, so goat's milk cheese is still cheese, but it's the least caloric of any of the milk Ooh, types. Good to know. So yeah, so, so eat more of it. Eat more. <laughs> if, you're on, if you're on a diet, I always say stay out of this place. But if you, if you can't resist, go with goat cheeses. So the, the, the flavor most has mostly to do with the lower fat content. Okay. I'm gonna go in for this one now. All right. So this one, coats my mouth a lot more because it doesn't have that extra sparkling water added to it. I'm gonna go in with this. Mm. Do, you, do you have a spreader? <laughs> do we have a spreader in the shop? <laughs> <laughs> nope. Mm. And so this is gonna have more age on it. The, the, um, the naked goat, which is the, the drunken goat that's not drunk, it's naked, <laughs> is aged about three or four months, thank you. And so what happened just now, I took a sip of the cocktail, I took a bite of cheese, and then I took a sip of the cocktail. And the second sip, the cocktail was a lot brighter. Mm -hmm. It really like bloomed in my mouth, um, which is really interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so that's that's the like kind of the, that's why, why pairings are fun, is like you taste something individually on the, the cocktail or the cheese and then when you put them together you get something completely different and that's what we're looking for and that's kind of what we, that's what we refer to as complexity and you get complexity in aged cheeses um, so that's I would say there's there's a lot of things that happen as a cheese ages and you know one thing is if I were to say it in a very broad sense is the cheese gets all of its character or complexity during aging um, it'll also lose moisture so it'll become a harder cheese but you'll you'll get um, you know, a cheese that has something on the start, something in the middle, something on the finish, and that's what you're looking for when you're tasting um, with with a cocktail that has multiple ingredients. Um, and then going back to the um, the Bouche de Chev, which was the first cheese, um, they, you know, another word for aging is, is ripening. 
And um, as soft cheeses ripen, um, they get softer. And in fact, another name for these types of cheeses is soft ripened cheeses. That's, that's kind of, it's like almost a category. I don't like to use that term too often because it sounds too technical and kind of intimidating to say soft ripened. Um, but these cheeses will get softer. And so just under the rind, there's a kind of a gooier layer as it, um, it that's where it shows its age. Mm. So the, the older it gets, the softer it gets and it kind of creeps towards the middle and it gets more, um, it gets stronger. And so that's, that's where the flavor becomes a little bit more, it gets more depth, like we were talking. So you, you were saying how it didn't taste as tangy. Right. It has more of that like uh, kind of fattiness. It, it, that's also from the ripeness of the cheese. I have to say the texture of this cheese, it's so creamy. Mm -hmm. I, I'm in love with it. And the name, Bouche, Bouche de Chev? Bouche de Chev. Bouche de Chev. I yeah. mean, what a fun name. We have another cheese called Boucheron or Boucheron Dan. And it looks exactly like this, and it just, it also comes from the name, the word log. Mm. And so, funny, the funny thing about cheese is if you just take one little step to look up the name of the cheese and what the, the name means, it tells you a lot. Uh, in this case, it's just a, a description of the shape of it, but more often it's the name of the town, the village, the region, um, especially for the old world cheeses, because they're all tied to those regulatory governmental systems that protect the names of the cheeses, just like champagne is protected. So similar to wine. Uh -huh. Okay. Yep. Yeah. And in fact, the same system that protects wines also protects cheeses. And so they're, they're tied together in that way. And they're very closely linked to their place. And the idea being that the animal, um, the, it's all, it's all kind of based on the diet of the animal. And if the, the you are what you eat. Mm. So whatever grows in that place, it comes through in the milk, and and when you taste the cheese, you're tasting that place. I love that. Yep. So um, the in the the third the third cheese, which is the Emmental or Emmentaler, is this guy. Now um, you all you all know this cheese mm. as as Swiss cheese. Um, mm. This Emmental is actually named for a place called the Emmy Valley in Switzerland, and uh, the the cheese was finally protected in 2000, so 20 years ago, although this type of cheese, and look at, this is a tiny little portion of the wheel. These wheels get to be about 200 pounds. So this is like, I don't know. You know it's a crumb. It's, it's like a, yeah, it's a crumb basically. <laughs> but um, this cheese has been made for probably a thousand years and they finally protected it in 2000. But they, because the cheese has been copied and in, 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 you know, the recipe has basically been stolen so often throughout the years. Uh, the name Emmentaler is not protected, but the name Emmentaler Switzerland is protected. So those two words together are protected. Mm. And so this is Emmentaler Switzerland. It's protected by Emmentaler the Swiss, the Swiss and um, but this is the white cheese with the holes in it, but yes. this is like the real version of it. So what causes the holes? So that's a bacteria that will basically explode and create these air pockets in the cheese as it's aging. And this is this is one cheese because of the bacteria. There's a really long name, but we call it Shermani. Because of that, this like bread, this cheese will expand, mm -hmm. where other cheeses will shrink. So like Parmigiano Reggiano, for example, that'll lose maybe 20 pounds over a couple years. This thing will get will get bigger. All those little bacteria just like exploding yeah. and yeah. expanding. That's super fun. All right, two couple comments from our friend George. Southside cocktail, very refreshing. Mm -hmm. And enjoying it with the bouche de chev and the naked goat. Nice, Ooh. nice. So there's comment there. And Professor from Victor. Hello, Victor. The question, which of these should he save to make a grilled cheese sandwich? Oh, Victor, Ooh. okay. <laughs> Emmentaler, Emmental, Gormino, Gormino Emmental, whatever we want to call it. <laughs> Emmentaler Switzerland um, is the one for that. Um, so you probably would want to... Um, grate it a little bit, but that's going to be the best one for grilled cheese. Um, my, f and you, if you have any leftover of this apricot, chili, apricot, apricot, however you say it, um, this would be incredible on a panini as well. Sweet and savory. Yep. And and so when we talk about pairing, um, we you've probably heard us go through the spiel before, but there's no hard and fast rules. There's no right or wrong. Um, you know. I, I hate for, for people to think they have to do it a certain way. It's all about kind of playing around with, with what you have in front of you, but you can go balance or contrasting with something sweet, and that is, that's the oldest trick in the book. Um, you know, the pickles are gonna give you a nice balance to, um, 
you know, to, to the to the, the saltiness, it's going to give like kind of a, a sour, um, you know, offset. The the kikos, the corn nuts, are crunchy and savory, um, and then of course the blueberries are sweet. So you, you can go any kind of direction you want. Hmm. I have to say, with the Swiss, I was shocked at how what it, I don't know how to describe it. That kind of crystally, that crystallized flavor, or when I'm eating um, something that's like a gouda that's aged and it's like crystals that you're biting on. Yeah. I got that from there and I wasn't expecting it. I can see. So this one, the, these cheeses age 15 months to 24 months. And so this is, this is probably closer to 15 months, but really at 12 months, the amino acids will start to crystallize and, and you can, you can taste them. The older the cheeses get, the more crystally they'll get. Mm. Um, the last cheese, the Pasqui Sir, which I'll talk about in a second, might have more of that. But I can even see in my pieces of Emmental a little bit. I can see those little white flecks in it. Mm, okay. I'm glad that you called it crystally as well. Uh, I was afraid that I was making no. words up as we were going along here. Well, one thing that people say that, that is not entirely true is they call them salt crystals. It's not really salt. I mean, there's some salt, obviously salt in the cheese, but it's amino acids. They're mm. called, the, the technical term is tyrosine. Tyrosine crystals. Tyrosine crystals. Yeah. Tyrosine crystals. <laughs> and you're right when you said goudas, because goudas, we don't have a gouda today, but if you like that crunch, then look for the aged goudas. Aged cow's milk goudas are going to be the crunchiest of the crunchy. Four or five years. Um, and now I want to talk about, is there another question? There is a question, very important one for Jade. Yes. What do you do when you run out of gin? <laughs> oh my goodness. Tragedy. I go to my trunk and I pull out more. <laughs> 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 um, if you run out of gin, though, the, the great thing about cocktails is you can sub in or out your citrus, your sweet, and your spirit. So this recipe that I gave you, you can sub tequila, mezcal, whiskey, rum, vodka. It doesn't matter. Just use whatever spirit you love the most. Um, and that's going to make the best cocktail. So I'll be sad if you run out of our gin, but you can always run down to your local liquor store and pick up another bottle. We should tell them, is there a rivalry between vodka and, and gin? Like, um, just, you're the gin. I'm yeah, I don't think there's a rivalry. Okay. I mean, we make vodka as well. So we have vodka, oh. gin, rum, um, and a coffee liqueur. So we have a lot of different options. But, you know, I think that... Vodka, you know, people that love vodka, they love vodka. Um, and they don't really want, you know, yeah. anything else. And that's fine. But I think a lot of times people start with vodka. And then they, they kind of work their way up. Yeah. Um, one cool thing about our gin, a lot of times when I'm doing demos and, you know, trying to get people to taste this gin, a lot of people will say, um, I don't like gin. I hate gin. Um, it tastes like pine trees. And I encourage them to actually try this one because this is not that type of gin. Mm -hmm. um, I totally understand what they're saying, something that's dry and really juniper forward. What's cool about this is it's not that. Um, it's completely different. You've got all of these fresh herbs um, that are bursting um, on the palate and on the nose. The juniper is kind of in the background. Mm -hmm. So if you like cilantro, you like cucumber, lime, sage, all of that is in this bottle. So I'm happy to say a lot of times when people try this, they say, wow, you're right. This doesn't taste like that gin mm -hmm. that, you know, that I'm used to drinking. And I've turned, you know, gin haters into gin lovers. So I, I love that you say that because I always, you know, draw parallels. I always think of similarities when, when, um, when I hear other, other people talk about kind of their craft or what, what, what they work with. And uh, I hear people all the time come in and say, I, I hate goat's milk. I hate goat cheese. And then I'll give them something like this, and they, they don't think it's goat cheese. Right. And they go, oh, that's delicious. Well, you do like goat cheese. Because they've never had, right. you know, or something that's gouda different. Or goat or something like that. Yeah. yeah. It's fun. You guys have hit a nerve. We're too divided a nation, AJ says. We need to embrace <laughs> all spirits. Exactly. <laughs> them all embrace together. them all. Drink what you love. What do you say to these whiskey people that poo-poo the, the clear drinks? What's up with that? I mean, <laughs> I think... Like she, Everyone's like, thinking it. They're like, just afraid they're too. They don't want to say it. <laughs> what, what do we say to them? I love whiskey. I love dark spirits. <laughs> I love the complexity. Um, you know, whether it's Scotch whiskey or rye whiskey, I love sipping that neat and maybe having a cigar with it. But I think there's a time and place for everything. Yes. Thank you. And you know, 
sometimes I just want a really good 50-50 gin martini, really clean and simple with a little olive. And then other times I want a beautiful aged whiskey, you know, with maybe one rock um, with my dessert. I could not possibly agree more or have said it better. There's a time and place for everything. That's why I, I always, I probably say this once every class that we do, there is no, there's no best. There, right. there is your favorite right now or what you're in the mood for. So like, I would compare that to to make another similarity. Um, we have mozzarella, we, we have fresh cheeses, you know, ricottas and mozzarellas that we wouldn't have on a, on a plate like this. But there is a time and place for a caprese salad. Sure. There's also a time and a place for a crunchy gouda or a parmigiano reggiano. There's, one is not better than the other. Variety is a spice of life. Absolutely. And let's all come together. <laughs> the uh, you is for unity, okay? Never shame someone for <laughs> their preference, right? No, no, don't, no gin or cheese shaming, okay? No. No gin or cheese Another shaming. Question. What about pickle shaming? What if you're not a pickle lover? What cheese would you do with pickles? And which of the beverages would you do with pickles? Ooh. Oh, which one of the beverages that I have here? Yes, and in gin. gin. Yeah, so with a pickle. So pickle is, is tart, a lot of acid. Let's see, I would do something that's gonna cut through that acid. So for me, I wouldn't do a cocktail that has citrus. I would probably go with something a little cleaner. Um, I would do a martini. And I know, you know, we were just talking about that, but I think um, maybe a dirty martini um, or a, a classic martini that has maybe a half ounce of vermouth. So the vermouth is a beautiful ingredient that I think gets shamed a lot or looked down on yeah. uh, because here in America not a lot of people um, have experienced a really good um, vermouth so um, I encourage everyone to try really beautiful vermouths and keep them in your refrigerator after they're opened so back to that I would do a martini probably and I would do it up um, and stirred and I think that um, the oils in the gin, and even if you make it a little dirty, I think that's gonna go really well with a pickle. It's mm -hmm. gonna cut through that acid. Yeah, I, for cheeses and pickles, I, I'll tell you my favorite, I'll tell you the traditional pairing and then my favorite. Um, the traditional pairing is alpine with, with pickles, so like Ooh. raclette oftentimes gets served with, with pickles or pickled items. Um, yeah, this, the um, Emmentaler would be in that category. My favorite though are the are cheddars, really sharp cheddars, and um, I, that's just. There's a couple reasons. One is when you when when we say cheddar, don't think don't think block boring American cheese. I mean cheddars are some of the most complex cheeses in the world. They're very strong. They are very acidic, so that makes it complementary to a pickle, which is also acidic. But I think it's the strength with strength thing. I think they, they match up to each other and uh, and also a textural thing because like cheddars can be kind of dry, real cheddars can be kind of dry and crumbly and then you have that kind of burst of, of moisture and, and pickly stuff. Pickly stuff. <laughs> I think pickly you, you bring up a good point when you're talking about pairing. You can complement or you can yeah. contrast, right? Yeah. So it's whatever your preference is. You can go swing any way you want. <laughs> <laughs> Are you still talking about cheese? <laughs> you can also go, I mean, you can also go textural. You can also go regional. I mean, you can also just go wild card, as I call it, which is just, just taste everything. And if, if you like it, then you like it. There's, there's, you can't argue with that. <laughs> yeah. You know? Tasting everything, you might, you know, be surprised yeah. at what you, what really goes well together. I remember when I, uh, this is going to be so random, but when, a when <laughs> Gina, Gina loves the random. When Ace Ventura, when Ace Ventura came out, I read the reviews and they were awful, right? And then I went and saw it and I laughed my butt off. And I was like, Oh, wait. So I'm laughing. So that's telling me that, that this is funny to me. Not the New York Times review of it, right? right? Yeah. I'm just saying, like, if you enjoy it, then you enjoy it. Yeah. Let your and for this, like, let your palate guide you. Life lessons right here. Life coach. I'm very wise. If you enjoy I'm it, you enjoy wise. it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, from someone named Jeff, who I think is new. Wife and I have an ongoing argument. She's from France and says cheddar is not a real cheese. Well, there are some, so let me Whoa. tell the wife that there are some bad cheddars. So maybe you've had bad cheddars, but there are some good cheddars from Southwest England, and there are some good American copycats. When I say copycats, imitators, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Because um, some people do it well, they do it the traditional way. Now, craft singles, would I say that's a good cheddar? 
I mean, if you like it, then it's good, but... Is it considered cheddar? I it's in the cheddar family, yeah. I have to say I'm a huge Kraft American Singles fan. Yeah. I love beautiful cheese, but there is a place in my heart for that. There's a time and a place. I ate it growing up, and yeah. it's always in my fridge, and some of my friends give me a really hard time about <laughs> it. But I will continue to buy it. I'm going to make a confession. I have Velveeta in my fridge right now. You heard that. You heard it here. But we have a small child at home, so... She likes it. Spur, <laughs> that's my first child. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's why. We, that's why we had her, so I could buy a little beer. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Jade. And a question from one of our good friends, George. Um, can you go back a little bit on the different ice types, and could you buy those different ice types? In places? Absolutely. Yes. So there are a couple of places around town where you can buy cool ice. So um, in the beginning, I referenced Collins and Coop. Where are they? Collins and Coop is on El Cajon Boulevard. Um, let's see, what's right next the, to that? The Ethiopian store. Yes. And restaurant. Mm -hmm. uh, Medi Medina. They're I sort think. of close to Texas Street. I don't know. That's yeah, cool. it's about. It's probably like three blocks up from Texas. Okay. So El Cajon Boulevard, North Park. Um, it's a beautiful cocktail bartender supply store. Um, and they have everything there that you could possibly need. Um, they've got syrups, they've got tools, they've got really cool glassware. They also have ice. So you can pick up um, two inch cubes of ice, which is really cool if you're doing, let's say you're drinking a beautiful whiskey on, uh, on the rocks, or you make an old fashioned, um, or you want a martini, you don't want your ice to melt really quickly, you can put one of those two inch cubes in there, you can pick them up there. Um, some other cool places for ice, a lot of people don't know, Sonic, you can oh, get yeah. pebble ice, 10 pound bags for like four or five bucks. Um, pebble ice is some of my favorite. Pebble. How do they make it last so long? I, the pebble ice? What do they put in it? I, I don't I don't know. <laughs> pebble ice is super fun if you're doing tiki yeah. or you just love pouring your soda over it. Um, so that's a fun place to get ice. Where else? Um, you know, San Diego Ice Company. Oh, yeah. Um, they have dry ice. They've got um, ice that is kind of like the ice that you get from 7-Eleven or whatever, but they also have the cubes of the two inch blocks and they have like blocks that you can cut down yourself so um what about like restaurant depot places like that i do not believe so no it has to be very specific you know like place that does ice um so when you get cubes like that it's really cool because it's impressing if you've got company or if you just really want to enjoy a cocktail that doesn't get watered down too quickly yeah two inch cubes is i think someone out. should invent like a, a machine that makes different types of ice. I'm sure there is one, but like for the home. For like a so some of the new refrigerators yeah. have a, I think it's a ball, it's a sphere uh -huh. function. And I think it makes like five or six, cool. like yeah. a day maybe. Um, but I can see a lot of problems with <laughs> that. Um, but yeah, it's cool. If you, some people watching might have one of those uh, freezers that, that make them two inch balls. Um, or you know what, you can make these cubes yourself. So at Collins and Coop, they have um, ice molds. They've got individual ice molds for balls or spheres, um, and they've got the trays where you can do two inch, or two inch cubes yourself. So you've got options. Cool. Um, I should talk about the the, the fourth cheese, Kay. and then we'll make then we'll do the second cocktail. Yeah. And then we'll we'll eat again. Love it. Um, so this guy, and they're in these little triangular shapes. The tips of mine are chopped off, and um, but this is the Pasky Sir. Pasky Sir is, uh, it's Croatian. It's the only Croatian cheese that we normally carry. I think it's the only one I've, I've ever seen us carry. Um, it's from, it's actually from an island called Pog. And uh, so it's also known as Pog cheese or, or uh, Pog Island cheese. And it's basically the Croatian version of a Pecorino. And what's, what is a Pecorino? Pecorino just means it's a sheep's milk cheese from Italy. And of course, Croatia is just across the Adriatic. Um, so they've got sheep. It's it's a it's a place where sheep are happy, <laughs> um, more so than, than cows. And uh, so, you know, the the cheeses that stay local are, are probably mostly sheep's milk cheeses as well. Sheep's milk is really really rich. It's really complex. It tends to get aged, so that's why pecorinos are usually harder cheeses. So I would say if if I were to put this in any kind of category, this would be like the Croatian pecorino. 
basically. I can see that, but it's not as salty, which I like no. because if you're putting a lot of this like in your sauce, uh -huh. sometimes I, I get heavy handed and then no. it's too salty. But this, you still get all that rich flavor. And you're depth. right. It's not that salty. Mm -hmm. These cheeses age from, they go from a minimum of four months and then they get up to one and a half years. And um, I, this is probably clo like more closer to the one and a half year, I think. It's good. good. Yeah, I'm enjoying that. I think I want to try it with a little bit of this apricot. Robbie G, too. question from AJ. What's your favorite standalone cheese on the plate and then just overall? Um, Delvita. <laughs> well, my favorite is probably Emmental. Emmentaler. Yeah. I love <laughs> the Alpine cheeses. Um, I, I talk about them all the time, but anything in this family. Uh, Comte is one of my favorites for the, the, the French lady out there. Uh, Comte from French Comte is maybe my number one. Um, and then for, for hard cheeses, but these are all in the same family. Gruyere, um, there's one called um, Appenzeller that I really, really love. Fontina from Northern Italy. And then for soft cheeses, I'm, I'm gonna go back to the to the French classics. I love a camembert, like a really stinky camembert. Um, so that's not on our plate, but um, it's. I mean, it's it's like a it's it's almost like a it's like a brie, but it's a little bit stronger. It's from Normandy. They come in little ten ounce wheels. Um, very mushroomy, very earthy, and so just that on a piece of bread or crackers dinner for me. But it, I mean, it, it depends what I'm in the mood for. Last night I felt like blue cheese, and so I had a cheese called Saint Agur, which is a double cream blue. Saint Agur. Saint Agur. Saint Agur. These names are amazing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's, that's a fun thing about cheeses, is all kinds of crazy names. All right. You guys are eating and enjoying. Do you ever get nervous doing this on camera? Victor wants to know. Um, I, I not not anymore for me. You're nerve. I nervous. mean, I think the nerves come in like beforehand I get in my head and like setting up um, I can tell that I'm a little nervous a little anxiety but then once we start it's fine I've been a bartender or was a bartender for over 20 years and so performing and being behind a bar was my was my comfortable safe place um, something that I love doing so this is a little different way to do it but I can still you know, use those creative juices, working for the distillery, and then do fun stuff like this. So, yes, I do get nervous, but once we start, it's like riding a bike. I have to say, I used to, when we first started doing presentations in person, I would get, I got nervous. This is like a long time ago, 15 years ago, we probably, not that, 12 years ago we started doing it. And then I, I got so used to it, speaking, that I could just walk right up and just kind of, and go, and I, and I started kind of like, like almost liking it I the started, adrenaline the that adrenaline, you get adrenaline yeah, yeah I liked all the eyes on me I hate it's, it's embarrassing to admit it but I started liking it it is true and uh and then I was like man I, I think I would miss this if I didn't have this in my life and then in March everything went virtual and then I got nervous again mm. like uh, the first couple ones we did I was like this is different I can't see everybody's eyeballs yeah you know it's it's um it's not instant gratification yeah it's so it was um I had to kind of get used to it and and we do a lot of um, private virtual events. I, we probably did a hundred in December. Yeah. So there were days where I was sitting there you at home busy. on <laughs> Zoom. And I, but it's a little bit different on Zoom because I can I can see on the gallery all the, the, the faces, and that was helpful for me to be able to see the people. So being next to you or like knowing yeah. that you're so comfortable, it, it makes me more comfortable. So. Um, if I were to do something like this by myself, I think it's a little more nerve-wracking because you're just talking to a camera and you feel like you have to fill all the space. Mm -hmm. But when it's like this, going back and forth tandem, it's a lot more relaxed. Yeah. It's a lot more natural. Yeah, and then, and you give me lots of fodder, good thing, like lots to, to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> That's a compliment, by the way. <laughs> um, all right, so let's, uh, let's do the next cocktail. Okay. Do a little setup here. Okay, so the next cocktail that we are doing is the Blueberry Squall. And this cocktail is going to have um, a little more depth. Uh, we are using this delicious Sally's Greatest um, Blueberry Lavender Simple Syrup, Collins and Coop. Um, you guys got a little two ounce bottle in your box. So this recipe is a 
it's a gimlet basically um, and that was what the first cocktail was as well when you're talking about cocktail recipes they're all pretty basic and then you just kind of do variations of such so you could say this is a variation off of the cocktail that we just did so Can I back you up? What, what is a gimlet Can you define it? yeah so gimlet is simple syrup lime juice and then a base spirit so um, traditionally uh, excuse me gin mm -hmm. so I would do two ounces gin three quarter ounce lime three quarter ounce simple mm -hmm. gimlet shaken, served up. Um, I always hear that word. I didn't know exactly what it meant. <laughs> yeah. So it's fun because if you swap out the gin for rum, then you've got a daiquiri. Nice. So it's it's a really a lot more simple than, than people realize. I don't want to give away all of our secrets, <laughs> um, but yeah, it's the fun part of making cocktails. Okay, so we are going to start with our lime juice. So we're going to do three quarter ounce lime. And then the bottle that you received has two ounces. Um, traditionally, I do a three quarter, three quarter, so three quarter citrus, three quarter sweetener. Um, but those are sweeteners that I make myself at home. This one is not as sweet, so that's why the recipe that I gave you calls for an ounce and a quarter. So the fun part about this is you can make it as sweet or as less sweet as you want. So we're gonna put one and a quarter blueberry lavender syrup and then two ounces of gin you fill that right to the brim right perfect. to the top uh, when you're using a jigger like i said hold it very uh flat and then whatever measurement it goes all the way to the top or the meniscus um i remember that word from my mom right when i was a kid and she was teaching me how to use a measuring cup isn't that what they throw in the olympics <laughs> oh is that a disc I don't <laughs> I don't. <laughs> okay we're going in for some ice i also have my double fashion glass different types of ice I don't have to shake as long um, with this ice or I'm sorry I shake a little bit longer with this ice than you would if you were using let's say the bagged ice that you get from the gas station because the gas station ice melts a lot faster yeah. so you don't want to shake it as long that's a beautiful color yeah okay we're gonna do another little lime zest on here so a good recommendation when you're garnishing cocktails at home, a citrus garnish is always great on everything. Um, it adds this layer that, you know, you can't get with anything else. So I've now topped this with citrus. Let me give this a taste. <coughs> <laughs> There's a commercial. That was not supposed to happen. <laughs> um, That's awesome. <laughs> it's delicious. Um, I don't think it's too sweet. The citrus got me in the back of my throat that time. But, um, what I love about this syrup, the lavender is, is present, but it's really light. And right now, the flavor is changing. It's developing. And I've got blueberry, like, coating. That's awesome. My mouth right now. Yeah. yeah. So, well, I'm going to pass this off, so... Gina, Rihanna says the blueberry squall is. Yeah, I'm going to pass this off. There oh, you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did you see me drooling? <laughs> Save the best for last. Cheers. Uh, so Cheers. the viscosity on this drink is a lot different than these as well. So it's going to pair really well with those bigger, yeah. uh, more full fat cheeses that you have. Let me grab my cheese. And we, um, so we, we did the, the cocktails in, in a certain order. We kind of talked about this. Um, and so she said that since the 
um, the blueberry was going to, or the, the second drink would be stronger. We wanted to do it second, and um, and then of course it's it probably what we'll see going to match up, or and that's part of pairing too is is um, is hitting strength with with strength. Um, so it's probably going to do better with the older cheeses, and those are going to be the. Do you need cheese, Gina? <laughs> <laughs> Probably more like the Emmental in the Pasqui Sir. Yes. But try but try it with everything for sure. No, some more Pasqui. Jade, if you it was too sweet, can mm -hmm. you do anything about it? Once so, it's mixed. You could add a little more lime juice. But I would go really light, like maybe an eighth of an ounce and work your way up. Um, so an easy way to kind of combat that is start at three quarter, three quarter. So instead of doing mm. a full one and a quarter on this, always start three quarter, three quarter, and then you can work your way up. Mm. Excuse me. So lime, so lime juice, is it because like citrus will take sweetness away? It will. So when you're making cocktails, you always want balance. So generally you balance your citrus with your sweet. Mm -hmm. Um, but depending on the viscosity of the sweet, yeah. sometimes those ratios are different. So this simple syrup that I made um, is equal parts sugar water. So it's a basic simple syrup. Mm -hmm. um, this one is not as viscous. So when I did a three quarter, three quarter originally, it was way too tart. Um, and so I bumped it up. Also, you know, your limes are going to vary. So these limes were really, um, they weren't very juicy. Um, I think they were super concentrated. Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, you have to, it's just like all of your fresh, your fresh produce, your fresh herbs. It's gonna be a little different each time, but a general rule is three quarter, three quarter. Um, and you know, when I made this recipe, my limes might've been extra astringent and citrusy that day as well. Yeah. Yeah, it's, I mean it's good. It's um, it's like when we we talk about recipes and it's, you know, d don't worry about being too uh, too exact. You know, mm -hmm. it's like you can you can play around, you can mix and match, and and kind of having building blocks, as you said. Like if you if you understand some of the building blocks, the same thing with with cheese. Um, you know, people come in and they and they're looking for a specific cheese for a recipe, and and we might not have that specific cheese, right. but we'll have fifteen others that are perfect that fit that flavor profile or we can even suggest something totally different like you run out of gin try this or that and it's even I mean, there there's so many don't don't be married to an idea be, be willing to kind of play around and right. you know discover something new so something else too um dilution plays a, a key factor in your cocktail as well so when you're drinking your cocktail and you think that it just it tastes a little too harsh it might be that it's not diluted all the way. Oh. So shake it some more. Or if it's a stirred cocktail, stir it more. Um, I've never so, heard dilute, like when you said delusion, I was thinking like delusional, like a, I was thinking. Delusion, so. yeah. So the ice is, <laughs> when you're shaking, it's aerating the cocktail, yeah. adding texture, yeah. adding air bubbles. Um, it's chilling it and it's diluting it. So you need all three of those to be just right for your cocktail to taste perfect. Yeah. And balance, you know, balance is a word I, that I, I hear a lot with in with wine too, and um, and so that's you know when you when you talk like to sommeliers or even like cicerones, they talk about balance being more important than like being stronger or like uh, a higher alcohol or aged more. Like they're they're looking for that perfect balance, and I think that happens with cheeses as well. Um, we have people that come in and they they are like, oh well, I want the I want the oldest. They think the, that the oldest or the longest aged of something definitely means it's the best. And it's it's not really the case. It, what it it changes it. It, it makes it um, drier, more gritty, sometimes more crunchy. But it might not make it as as balanced as it could possibly right. be. Like it might be better balanced at two years as opposed to three years. It's finding that sweet spot. Yeah, it is. And that's what that's what um, you know, affineurs and cheesemakers. That's what that's what they're doing. It's all trial and error, especially with like the newer cheeses that we because we see new cheeses every week. I mean, every month we see a half a dozen new cheeses. Do you ever get tired of cheese? I don't. I, that's great. I don't. I mean, it's because because it's just a bottomless well of information, and I still feel like I don't know anything. So, I mean, even today, I'm sitting there making notes, reading over my notes in the car before I come in here, and uh, and I always learn something. And then I love, I love teaming up with people like you and hearing what you say, and then 
like I say, when when you say something, it, it'll spark something, and I and I think of a similarity, and it's just it's fun to I don't know, it's just kind of fun to to go down. Part of the fun is just is talking about it. Right. <laughs> I mean, really. I have to say so thank you for being yeah thank you I feel the same way um, especially you know missing that part of um, the camaraderie and the interaction that we get from for myself being in hospitality for so long um, and not being able to go into a restaurant and sit at a bar and talk to the bartender yeah. or look at a back bar and see something new that I haven't tried yet so it's the same, you know, as far as like this, I think, industry provides us with um, so much uh, that's constantly changing and so many new fun things. And it's cool when uh, I have an opportunity to work with someone new and learn something at the same time. So, yeah. Thank you. Well, so thank you so much for being here. Um, Jake, do we have any questions? We do. It's okay. very, I don't know if Rob, you can handle this question, <laughs> but it is a cheese related question. Which is I'm the nervous. better Cheeto? Better. The regular cheese puff, Woo! the crunch, or the flaming hot? This is so easy. We're all guessing what you're going to say. Okay. I, the flaming hot. Puff. Really? <laughs> oh, come on. I would say puff as well. Okay. I, so, I, no. I, I, the flaming hot, but the flaming hot, what I do with the flaming hot is you, ha is you balance it out. With, so you have it with something creamy. So try creamy cheese in a sandwich. So you can do you can do this with like a soft goat cheese. You can do this with a triple cream, and you put the the flaming hot Cheeto in with it, and <clears throat> you know choose your meat, just like you know choose your <laughs> choose your spirit, um, turkey, chicken. I mean whatever you want, and uh, and it's a perfect balance. And when you when you see there's there's a um, there's a deli in North Park, Fat Boys. They mm -hmm. have that flaming flaming Cheeto thing, but like. It, you, when you see chefs or wh whoever that in the, they're on the menu, they have what is seemingly like a very innovative dish, and you're like, "Wow, it's incredible! How they come up with that?" It's always based on these these little building blocks that mm -hmm. we talk about: salty, sweet, or texture, or a combination of a few of them. You know, so flaming hot, and that's the right <laughs> that's the right answer because it's my favorite. <laughs> try, try with cheddar <laughs> recommendation. From oh, I will, I will. I'll try it with everything. Um, any more questions? We should, okay. We got it. Well, with that, th again, thank you so much for being here, and thank you all for joining us on this Thursday. As Jade said in her final thoughts, it's all about community and coming together, and so um, we uh, we so appreciate you, and we will see you next time. Gina, when's our next one? Why not Wednesday? Next Wednesday. Next Nebbiolo. Wednesday. Next Wednesday, we'll be talking Nebbiolo and Barolo for Why No Wednesday. So, be there, be square. Bye, everyone. Bye. Have a good night. Or cheese. Yeah, that's yours. That's. Um. Well done, peeps. Oh, people.